last weekend I was, me and my beloved wife, we were in the uh, West Coast uh, in L.A. No, um, San Jose, actually. It's close to L.A., about six hours. And um, L.A. is one of the largest cities in the world. But in terms of giving, she's at the bottom most. Number 48 of the top 50. Okay? And I think it's not because they're poor. L.A. is, LA she's very rich. Right? But the, I think the reason why um, they lack in giving to charitable institutions, not only to churches, right? To charitable institutions. It's not the lack of resources, but rather there's a great possibility that the cause of this is her materialistic attitude and, and hedonistic lifestyle. People in L.A. were just plainly, bluntly materialistic, right? So they would rather get than give, okay? That's L.A. And the irony is, you know, Los Angeles, uh, the com complete name actually is, uh, that's just a short for Ciudad, let me say this properly, Ciudad de Los Angeles, Ciudad de Los Angeles, which means the city of angels, city of angels, right? Uh, and that's the irony, you know, but back here, now back here in Canada, if you total the average per capita, per resident, right, um, of those who pay cable TV compared to those who give to charity, it's measly 25%. Only, it's so, uh, what I mean to say is there are more people who actually spend on cable, cable TVs than those who actually give to charities. So are we, I think we are close to being like our neighbor down south, right? So this morning, <clears throat> I will not talk much up on why we are to give for the simple reason that God is gracious, and we know that already, right? Um, that is God's attribute. He makes the sun rise to the righteous and the unrighteous. He, make, he sends his rain to the just and the unjust, right? So he, he just blesses everyone. See, God doesn't choose whom he sends the rain to. He will just bless everyone. That's how generous our God is, right? So the question now is not the why, for this Sunday, not the why, but the how. How now should I give? So that's the title for this morning. How now should we give? Or make it personal to yourselves. How now should I give? Okay? So that's the title. Let's please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are to embark to a topic that may be delicate to some, but we pray that you may grow us in this aspect of generosity, O oh God. Lord, you taught us first how to give. And so today we ask that may you give us an open heart and an open mind and do your word through Jesus, our master and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at giving in the Old Testament. How did giving start in the Old Testament? You know what? This all started all the way back to the two sons of Adam and Eve, right? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, when, they, when Cain harvested and Abel gathered his flocks, right? They took a portion of their produce and gave it to God. So it started way, way back after creation, right? And then after that, um, another example was Abraham. Abraham took a tenth or a tithe of everything that he owned and gave it to Melchizedek, which is the, uh, in, in, in another uh, Sunday, we probably uh, learn who Melchizedek was. But uh, for short, Melchizedek is representative of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time. So he gave a tenth. And then, directly commanded by God in Deuteronomy 14.22, he said, You shall tithe 
all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year after year. So now, in the Old Testament, God directly commanded to his people, Israel, he said, give the tenth. What is a tenth? It's a tithe. It's a ten percent of everything that you earn, everything that you gather in, everything that you own. Ten percent of that goes to the tabernacle, to the temple, goes to the Lord, right? That's in the Old Testament. What did this Jesus say in the New Testament? What happened? I'll give you another example. Jesus was in the temple, right? He's watching people come in, right? He's right there by where they drop off their gifts. And then, of course, his disciples was with him, were with him. And, and uh, they were the rich. They're dumping bags upon bags of their coins. Of course, they're rich, right? And then here comes an old lady with her two copper coins and dropped it off. Jesus said, this is how you should give. The, of course, that puzzled his disciples and said, why? She just gave two copper coins. That's less than even our two pennies now. It's less than our two pennies. But Jesus, you know, you know Jesus' point was, you know, she gave everything that she had. She may not even know what she's going to eat for dinner tonight. But still, she gave everything that she owned. That's her life that she gave. The rich, they probably just gave what is in excess of what they had. It, there was a lot, of course, and a lot can be done when you give a lot. But that's not how God wants us to give. He wants us to give, you know, with the heart, with everything that we have. He wants actually our all. The life of the lady, of the old widow, that's what he wanted. Right? That's how it was done in the New Testament, the point that Jesus made was the rich gave out of the abundance and was probably giving, like I said, from their surplus, while the widow gave her last two copper coins, not knowing if she will have anything for supper that night. For the Lord, it isn't what the size of the gift, but the heart behind it, what mattered most. God looks in the heart of the giver, not the gift. Now, again, that question, how now should I give? How should I give? What does God expect from us? Obviously, we did not grow in the traditions of uh, Israel, right? We're, most of us, except for Rhonda. <laughs> All of us are Filipinos. And we didn't grow like, the, you know, we didn't grow up like uh, the Israelites did, giving a tenth of what we have, right? Obviously, and then, uh, but... I want you to open your Bibles in 2 Corinthians. That's our text now. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 to 5. And from there, I'm act I actually wanted to cover the entire chapter 8 and a portion of chapter 9. But let's see how we go this morning. And if I don't, let's continue on next week and then the week after that. So chapter 8, verses 1 to 5 of uh, 2 Corinthians. I'll read to you. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, 2 Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity in their part. For they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. May the Lord bless the reading of the scriptures. If you remember the history in the early church, of the early church in, in, in Acts, in the first century, there was a famine in the land. Jerusalem was suffering from a severe famine, and the church was not exempted from that. The church in Jerusalem also suffered. She had a great need at that time. So Paul wrote to the Greek Christians 
in the church in Corinth to give, to contribute to the church in Jerusalem. He asked them to be faithful in their giving. And so here is, it is now. This is how we should follow. This is the pattern that was done before, and this is what we're following now. Number one, our giving has to be intentional. Our giving has to be intentional. This statement exactly means what it says. You have to be intentional in your giving. That means that you have to have a plan on how you are to give back to the Lord. Don't just do it sporadically so that you will give whatever is in you. You know, you never planned it. You, just, you know, if it's offering time, okay, there's some here. I'll, no, that's not how you give it. You plan what you want to give. Often Christians will give more thought on how they are going to pay their internet bills, you know, their car insurance, their cell phone, and, uh, cell phone bills, uh, providers, and, you know, things like that, our normal uh, bills in our home. You know, we give thought to that. But uh, do you realize why they call our service provi cell phone ser uh, service provider a plan? You, you, you know why? Because you sit down with the agent and you plan what you want to spend, right? And then for the next two or three years, depending on what you sign there, you will be paying the minimum of that amount to the cell phone provider. It's a plan, right? That's how. That's how it is. That's why it's called a plan. The verses that we just read, Apostle Paul says to the Macedonian Christians, gave to the Lord first according to the means and then beyond. They planned on how to give. This group of believers first formulated formulated that they're going to give what they're going to give and have carefully planned out what they will give for the Lord. Probably the spouse sat beside his spouse, the husband sat beside his spouse and said, okay, this is what we normally uh, earn for a month or earn for a week and this is what we're going to give. Okay, this person, okay, okay, um, I, I, we earn this much. Let's, let's not even talk about how much first. How much percentage do we want to give first? Let's set that. Let's set that. And then later on, let's see what the dollar value would be. That's how you should give. You plan. They did this according to their means. And then what they felt the Lord wanted them to give. Of course, they sat. They, they talked about it. Right? What intrigues me here is that when they even begged the apostles to allow them to be a part of the giving. See, they're not exempted of that famine that was a great famine in the land. They were also in need, right? But and of course the apostle Paul know that you know you don't have to give much, right? You don't have to give much. But they were begging the apostles so that they will be a part of this giving as well. They wanted to be a part of giving. Right, and but how they were able to do that, you know, how were they able to do that when they were already, uh, uh, you know, they were also in need? I'm sure it was all because the Lord generously provided for them to be able to contribute to the saints, to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. That's generosity, that's intentional giving. You know, you sit down and plan with intention to give. That's pre-planning. Reading on in our text, as we continue, verses 10 and 11 in that same chapter, it says there, and in a matter, in this matter, I give you my judgment. Apostle Paul talking, right? This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also desire to do it. So he was now writing, and they started giving a year ago, right? So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. Number two, the Apostle Paul is saying, you desired, you planned, you sat down with your spouses, you talked about it, you have a good plan, now follow through. 
Number two, our giving has to be faithful. We have to be faithful in completing what we have decided to give back to the Lord. The church in Macedonia made a commitment to God that they would give what they determined was right and Paul encouraged them to follow through. Elsa has been following uh, the game of tennis, the Open Tennis, the U.S. Tennis Open. And of course, as you notice, all the players, whenever they hit the ball, even if the ball is already on the other side of the court, you will see them following through. That's how a good strike of a tennis would be, right? There has to be a good follow-through, even in baseball. They don't just do this and then stop. No, they have a follow-through, right? Golf, same thing. It has to be a good follow-through, right? And the same thing is true with giving. You plan, you be faithful. You follow through in what you have planned. When we make a commitment to God that we would give, when we have already pre-planned and have scheduled a way of giving to God, then we should be faithful to follow through with our commitment. God, give what you have set in your heart to give, not reluctantly, but with a cheerful heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's why we did that exercise earlier. Let's do it again. Church, it's giving time! Yay! See? It's not that hard. <laughs> you might think to yourselves now, you don't know my situation. You know? I have only... I only have so little and I have so much need. I have so many bills to pay. Right? Of course, each one of us have our own specific and unique need and situation. Right? Each one of us. I cannot deny this. Even I myself, you know, have that need. But is my God different than your God? Or is the God of Israel in that time different from our God now? Or is the God of the New Testament church different from our God? Has he changed? Uh, no, no. He has never changed. In fact, as a matter of fact, he will never, ever change. And the way he appropriates for his people has always been the same. He will bless his people. Remember the Exodus? When the people of Israel were complaining for food and they wanted something to eat, Right? They were saying, oh, how we miss the onions and the garlic and all the spices in Egypt. We want that again. That's not true. They were slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And they were probably eating mud and straw. Right? But they, they were saying, you know, oh, we miss Egypt. We miss Egypt. So God said, okay, tomorrow you will eat something. You'll have something. But you only have to gather what you need. For that day, and then the following day, I'll give you again. Trust me, I'll give you again the following day. So the following morning, people went out, and they saw something. What is this? Something, you know. And he said, it's manna. That's manna. So they gathered manna. Some gathered less, some gathered more, right? But when they measured, they took the omer and measured, what did the Bible say? What did the Bible say? When they measured with an omer, whoever gathered much have nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each one of them gathered as much as they could eat. Nobody lacked. Everybody had what they need. Why? My question though now is, why would anyone gather less than they need? I ask myself that, you know, then it came to me, the old, the weak, you know, those who are a bit infirm, they cannot gather much. If you relate it to us now, there are some who doesn't earn as much, there are some who earn more, right? But at the end of the day, what did, this, what did the word say? Those who earn more did not, did not have an excess. Those who had little, they had enough. That's how God appropriates for his saints. 
Yeah, it's for his church. God will make sure that the lacking will have enough. The weak will have what they needed for the day. And then the following day, of course, there's man again. The following day, of course, there's man again. Until such time that they cross the Jordan River. You know, for 40 years they went in the desert. They were in the desert. They never lacked food. But as soon as they crossed the river and ate of the produce of the land, manna stopped. That's how God provides for his people. We give in faith with a cheerful heart and we have to do it consistently with follow through. This I can promise you and I, will, I totally believe on this that God will make good with his promise to provide your every need. He will. Definitely he will. Moving on to our text. Turn to the next chapter. Chapter 9 and verse 7. 9 and verse 7. It says there, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful giver. I'll say that again, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. I love that. It was like he was repeating himself. The Apostle Paul, you know, when he wrote this, we have studied the epistles of John. And, and like I said in the past messages, whenever a writer will repeat himself, that means what he wrote down is important. So when I repeat myself here, when I repeat myself here, well, you know, <laughs> that means what I'm going to say is important, right? You do not give reluctantly. You do not give under compulsion. You do not give re <laughs> reluctantly. I can't do this over and over. I have seven, six siblings. I can do this all day, you know. Um, but I mean, God loves a cheerful giver and he wants that to be us as well. He wants us to give to him cheerfully, right? Our giving should never be out of guilt. It should never be out of persuasion or prideful desire for the praise of others. No. When we give, we want to give to God. It is something that we must bring before the Lord in our sincere and clear conscience. Decide what is right according to your faith, according to what your heart tells you, and it should never be an afterthought or only considered when we can spare it to. No. You talk to your spouse and say, okay, on Wednesday we will sit down and we will plan. And we will sit down before the Lord and we will plan this. You know, and talk about how we are to give. Clear? So what are those? Number one. Number one. Our giving has to be intentional. Number two, our giving has to be faithful. Number three, our giving has to be sincere. In the past, this is how they do it. And I think it is wise to follow their example. If a farmer has a field, let's say he's got a thousand acres. Oh, that's too big, too big to imagine. Let's, let's say 10 acres of land, okay? A farmer has 10 acres of land. What the farmer will do is outright, even before he scatters the seed, he will cut it, a tenth of it, you know, and say, this portion is for my God. You know, whatever comes out of this field is from my God. Now, he does that, right? And he scatters the seed. He will not treat that seed as special as anyone else, as any part of uh, any parcel of the land. You know, he will put as much seed percentage-wise as he put in that portion of land as he does for the rest of the land. So if he say, you know, if he are, is going to spend 10 bags of seed 
in the entire 10 acres, he will put one bag of seed in that 10th part of the land. And then take care of it like he take cares, takes care of the rest of his property. At the end of the day, harvest time comes. He will gather that and everything that comes from that is apportioned to the Lord. Easy. No more math needed. That's how you do it. Same thing, you know, with us. That's the question that's going to be pro probably you're going to be asking. You know, what? How do I do? How do I do it? How do I give back to the Lord? Well, then, yeah, a portion, a, you know, set a portion even before you have your check. Even before, if you are salaried, even before the check goes directly to your bank and it's, it gets credited to, you, to your account, even before that happens, you already know how much percentage you give back to the Lord. Set it. Now, there's probably a question that you want to ask me. Why do I do it? What benefit is it for me to give in this manner? If I plan, if I talk it with my spouse, what do I really gain from this? I'm not going to talk about the benefits that's for sure you will get when you get to see Jesus. No, not that. Plus, we can never outgive God. Right? We can never outgive God. And the best thing of all, you can never buy your ticket to salvation. No. So that's not what I'm, gonna, I'm talking about here. The benefit that I'm talking about here is, is this. When we choose to give this way, when we choose to give intentionally, when we are faithful in our giving and when we are sincere in the way that we give, we begin to feel the benefits of being faithful in this area almost instantly. You know, for husband and wives, it causes us to, be, to have a better communication. That's, I'm just testifying to what happened between me and Elsa, right? Um, we develop a good communication with regards to finances. As we prayerfully work these things and detail it out together, right? We learn to even more trust each other regarding the way that we handle our finances. You know, you know that uh, Elsa is not just going to go out there and see a, uh, a garage sale and spend right away. No, <laughs> because we already have a pre-planned amount to give to the Lord, right? And a pre-planned amount to do his uh, garage sale, whatever. We learn to do this and to do it faithfully. Um, we learn to be good stewards of God. And besides that, the sporadic and, and, and impulsive buying is actually lessened. You know, you are able now to control. I'm proud to say this, that Elsa is no longer an impulsive buyer. Uh, I hope. <laughs> but uh, if not totally gone, it's lessened. We even get to save more and give more if you plan this. Also, you know how it is when someone comes to you and, you know, a, a charitable institution knocks at your door and, and you feel the guilt because you are not able to give, right? Well, that guilt is not there anymore. You know why? Because you know that you have a plan in giving back to charity, to the Lord. Now you know where your charity goes, right? We cannot gracefully... Some, you know, now we can gracefully turn down these requests that bombard us. You know, in the phone, there's calls in the phone as well. And then we feel guilty because we cannot give. Now, since we are giving, we can say, you know, we already have apportioned our uh, uh, gifts to this charitable institution. Now we know that we are growing in generosity with God's strength and guidance and provisions. You know, so now that has already been taken care of. Right? So, how can I start in giving this way? That's probably your next question, right? Faithful giving begins with 
prayer. So when you sit down with your spouse, first thing that you do, you pray. Before you even plan, before you, you do anything, the very first step you do is to pray. Ask the Lord for wisdom and for His provision. Pray. Ask Him to set in your hearts His perfect will on what you will give back to Him. You want to consider reading our text again, you know, with your spouse? Read chapters 8 and 9 again. And the Lord will show you, set that amount on how a manner in which you are to give. Next, take your first step after you've prayed and seek the Lord's guidance, then step. Step forward. If you've never done it before intentionally, then now set a giving plan for the first time. I was, the plan was I was going to ask uh, Brother George to bring this now out. But see, I have a props here that says 3%, 5%, 7%, and um, 10 and then 10% plus. Right? If you've never done 3%, try 3%. Right? If you've been giving more than 3, probably you're giving 7. Then set that and then goal, set the goal for the next rung. Right? If you're already there at giving 10%, you know, Here's the challenge now. And here's sacrificial giving. 10% plus whatever percent you set before you. But you have to set your first rung, your first step. You have to do that first step and rise in the ladder of giving. That's how we should give. Once you know your percentage, what that is, we, see, I'm talking about not the dollar value here, right? I'm talking about the percentage. Once you have set that, then get your calculator and punch in the dollar amount, right? Write the check as soon as it, you get the pay, as soon as uh, it gets deposited in your account, or like I said earlier, if you have auto credit, then take it out, right? Cash and give it to the Lord. That's your first fruit, first fruit. Ask the Lord to help you see what will be within your means and faithful and sacrificial. Be consistent. Do it every payday. That way, you will be doing faithfully and in faith. Faithfully and in faith. But you have to take your first step. Right? Take your first step. Earlier, I said to you, you can never outgive God. That's a good spot for an amen. 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 See, that's, you can never outgive God. Amen. He made this promise that when we start to return to Him, our produce, in the manner that He wants us to return, He will open up the floodgates of heaven. I saw a big dam. I don't know where that was, but there's a dam, and I saw the floodgate. You know, imagine that floodgate when they lift that up. Imagine the rush of water. Now, imagine that water is our blessings from God. When God opens the floodgates of heaven, imagine the blessings. That's not my word. That's God's. He will open up His floodgates on you. We always hear this every time the challenge was given during a, a giving time. Right? Give back to the Lord and He will open the gates and the windows in heaven and pour out to you blessings that you will never have enough storeroom to keep. So much blessings you will have overflowing blessings. Now you're able to give to someone who is in need, right?
I also mentioned earlier that we can never buy our salvation. Never. Right? Even if I get myself, myself burnt at a stake, like what the Apostle Paul says, that can never buy myself to my salvation, for my salvation. No. Because the only way, and I want to be very clear on this, salvation is never for sale. Jesus never said, okay, I'm for sale. No. Although salvation is free, it's never cheap. You can never buy it. It can never be bought. And the sacrifice that Jesus did, you can never buy. What he did on the cross, the sacrificial substitutionary death that he did on the cross, you can never buy that. It is the only means of cleansing of all the sins of the world. It is the only... It is, I, I came up with this and I thought it was beautiful. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only monetary system that is, uh, that you can use in heaven. If you have that monetary system, not dollars, not euro, not pounds, it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you show that, okay, can I come in? Of course, you know, that guy on the door will say, come in, come on in. The Lord Jesus Christ will say, welcome, my servant. That's the monetary system that I will consider here in heaven. That's the only thing that we need to have if we want salvation. So I want to be clear here. We can never buy our salvation, our entry to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only worthy sacrifice and the only payment 